Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the session on land reform and unlocking agriculture value chains um, as part of the South African Investment Conference 2020. Uh, my name is Tafadzo Mudgiwa. I'm an associate partner at Let's Emma Consulting and Advisory, uh, which is a uh, professional services firm at the height of a diversified investment company. I'll be moderating the session today on land reform and unlocking agriculture value chains. Uh, on this discussion, the key focus is going to be on, on looking at the land reform opportunities and how to unlock opportunities in agriculture value chains. Uh, we're also going to have a discussion around the public-private uh, partnerships, tapping into export markets, and just the appropriate development support vehicle that we can potentially use in this space. So I'm going to start by introducing the panel that we have. Um, so I'm joined by the Minister of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development, Minister Tokozile Dideza. Um, and just a brief biography on her. She served as the first woman Deputy Minister between 1994 and 1999, uh, Deputy Minister of Agriculture, under the leadership of uh, President Nelson Mandela. She was appointed Minister of Agriculture and Land Affairs between 1999 and uh, 2004 and between 2004 and 2006. In 2005, she also convened the National Land Summit involving a range of stakeholders to reflect on land reform. She was appointed Minister of Public Works uh, between 2006 and 2008. Uh, the minister holds a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree from UNISA and um, a Master's in Tertiary Education Management from the University of Melbourne in Australia. Minister, welcome to the session. Thank you very much, uh, Tafi. I'm also joined by Kali Shoman, who is uh, the Managing Director of Shoman Bordery, which was founded by his grandfather, Carol Shoman, um, 101 years ago, which is a long time ago. Um, and ironically, he was the founding, the grandfather was the founding member of what we know as the IDC today, and the chair of the Bando Investment Corporation. Uh, development is, has been running in the family, I guess. Um, Kali serves on the board of the Agriculture Development Agency. He ex is an executive of, the, of Grain SA and serves in an advisory capacity in various industry bodies. He is the chairman of Olefund Irrigation Board. And um, I think it's worth noting that he's involved in various farming operations and programs which involve the empowerment of emerging farmers. I'm going to ask during the discussion for Kali to unpack some of this because there are key lessons that 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 we can uh, take from an opportunity perspective. Uh, and then lastly, I'm joined by Mr. T.P. Nchocho, uh, who's the CEO of the IDC. Uh, this is a role that he assumed in January 2019. He has over 20 years um, experience in the economic development finance space and the banking arena. So before joining IDC, he was CEO of uh, the Land and Agriculture Development Bank, the Land Bank, as we know it, which is a position that he held since uh, February 2015. Um, his career uh, in economic development finance and banking spans over 20 years, having previously served as a group executive of um, the DBSA, a portfolio which uh, saw him manage the DBSA infrastructure project finance debt and equity investments. He holds a degree in um, a BCom degree from the University of uh, the North, uh, a master's in business leadership from UNISA, and an MSc in finance from the University of London, as well as an advanced uh, management program from um, Harvard University. So welcome to the session. Thank you. And um, as we can all see, our panel in our panel, we've got um, a land reform expert, um, we've got a development finance expert, and um, a farmer. So we should expect uh, a great conversation. So I think just before we go in, just reflecting on 2020, uh, the year 2020. I think it's it's been a bad year for most of us uh, because of COVID-19. Uh, but when you look at the COVID-19 crisis, um, it, it has just clearly demonstrated the vulnerability of livelihoods of, of many South Africans. And this was highlighted through food security issues that we've seen 
um, even though the government had to step in. So many would, would argue that, you know, reducing the vulnerability of the livelihoods of the poor and the associated food insecurity must be a key focus for the sustainable development of, of um, South Africa. So one of the key policies um, is, is what we're also going to discuss today, uh, which can play a critical role in this space, which is the land reform policy. Um, I think it's, it's also important to note that uh, President Ramaphosa you know, affirmed as, as, um, in parliament as he was getting in that you know, the, the government's commitment to accelerate our land re, uh, redistribution program, not only to redress uh, the historical injustices, but to also bring more producers in the sector and make more um, land available for cultivation. And there was an insistence on, on food security as well. So um, I'm going to uh, uh, ask the first question to the minister. And I think it's important before we go into the discussion, just to contextualize the discussion, to go into uh, clarifying land reform and what it is, and the current strategy on land reform um, and unlocking agriculture value chains uh, from a government perspective. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Tafi. To the fellow panelists, as well as to the listeners and those who are participating in this webinar. It's a great opportunity that all of us are reflecting on this question, but I just think in starting the conversation, we need to anchor the land reform debate in South Africa correctly in terms of our constitution of 1996, which recognized the need for equitable access to land. You'll find that in uh, the Bill of Rights, section 25, and as it goes on. It also instructs the state to take reasonable measures, including legislation, to actually deal with the issues of uh, equitable access to land. So that's the framing. And if one takes that into consideration, what does this mean or what did the drafters of the Constitution have in mind? It was about redressing the injustices of the apartheid past to foster national reconciliation and stability because for me, this conversation must not divide us as a country, but must actually enable us to say, how do we deal with our past in ensuring that we can actually build national uh, reconciliation, social cohesion, and stability around the issue of land and agrarian reform in our country. Also, land reform must underpin economic growth. And I think that's the debate we're talking about today. How does land reform underpin you know, agricultural uh, development and economic growth. It's also about the issue that you are touching, uh, Taffy, to improve household welfare and alleviate uh, poverty. So when President actually spoke in Parliament this year, as well as when he took office, he emphasized that government will stand by these commitments that our constitutional drafters and our founding fathers wanted us to deal with in respect of land reform. But land reform is actually a base around which we can create growth. From an agricultural uh, perspective, one of the things that we think it's necessary is to ensure that in the way in which we deal with land reform, we bring inclusivity and participation in the agricultural value chain, starting from production into the agro-processing. We want to ensure that we are able to create jobs that are necessary in our country, as well as eradicating hunger. Therefore, the issues of transformation and redistribution, in our view, is key. The issue of addressing inefficiencies that are there, it's another important element. Growth and expansion would require investment that must be made in agriculture. Firstly, on those areas where people have received land, from the state through the various programs of land reform, which is land restitution, land redistribution, and tenure reform. But also assisting those citizens who have seen an opportunity in agriculture and entered the sector, but would require some support from government. It's also about ensuring that we are able to measure the impact that we are doing as part of our consultation. 
But the state cannot do all of this alone. We require partnership from a range of players. We do have resident expertise in our country of people who, against all odds in terms of our climatic change, have been able to make a success in the agricultural sector of our country. And therefore, we need to draw on those expertise. But we need flexible financing arrangement to support agriculture in the long haul. And I think the challenges that we're experiencing at the moment in the land bank, but also that our financial institution can take up more debt in terms of financing agriculture will require innovation from our side. It is for that reason that as a state, when we look at financing, we've also agreed that it is necessary to look at a combination of grant and loan, and therefore engaging a number of players, starting with our development financial institutions such as IDC, which does have an agribusiness portfolio, but in our view, we can actually do a little bit better in also expanding on the development side. Working with our financial institutions, your Standard Bank, your APSA, to be able to make sure that those who enter from that space can find it uh, accessible. We also need to partner with other players who actually are there in the sector and they can actually bring different technical skills that are required in support of those who have received land. Kali, as you have mentioned, is part of ADA, which has been having a conversation with us on how from a range of areas through training of those who have come in into the space, but also creating opportunities for market access and a number of partnerships working in the sector that can actually make us succeed. From the side of government, we've just released 700,000 hectares of land, but release of land is just but one element of creating access. But what is more important, it's leveraging on our resources as well as the resources of our partners in supporting those who would have received uh, land uh, in order to succeed. I must say from the policy front, we've also ensured that we create a policy environment that can enable people to participate in the sector. For instance, in the past few years, even when I wasn't there as a minister, but I know my colleagues have actually engaged with some of the farmers and other landowners who are saying we would want to participate through donations in, you know, of land to government, but what is the policy framework? So I just want to say that the donations policy will be finalized by cabinet uh, within this current financial year. It has been out for discussion. The beneficiary selection policy is another, as well as the national policy on comprehensive producer development support, which gives a policy response to address the gaps that have been identified in the provision of agricultural support packages to farmers in the different ranges of the scale of the farming operations from small to actually our mega farmers that are there. So we are having a conversation at a sector level in creating an agriculture and agribusiness master plan, which is a long term a plan of saying, how do we get where your NDP wants us to get as a sector, as well as beyond, both in terms of creating opportunities for market access, of strengthening our institution, of supporting those who are there in the sector. In the nutshell, I think that can create the basis for starting to engage in this discussion. So, so thank you so much for providing that context. Um, and I think one thread that can come, uh, kept coming out in, in your context is the importance of, um, of pulling resources and partnerships um, and, and attracting investment in this space. And I think part of that as well is uh, for the different stakeholders to be at ease and to be on the same page. So a follow-up question that I just wanted to ask you um, is on the land reform policy itself uh, and for, for the benefit of potential investors in the agriculture space, can you just put them at ease in terms of just the status of, um, of uh, the land reform policy uh, specifically the amendment of section 25 so that everyone because there is a lot that's said around but it's important that you you clarify the position of government um before we actually go into the discussion around um well, thank you very much. can explore thank you very much uh, taffy we do have 
the land uh, policy of uh, 1997, which guides our land reform pro program in South Africa. And I must say that that policy framework, as I said earlier, is anchored on what our constitution says uh, in respect of this uh, sector of our economy. For instance, if you look at our constitution, it says a person or community dispossessed of property after 19 June 1913 as a result of past racially discriminating laws or prejudices is entitled to the extent provided by the Act of Parliament, either to restitution of that property or to equitable redress. And we do have the Restitution Act that provides that. It further says the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to foster conditions which enable citizens to gain access to land. And the last element that you'll find in the constitution, it's about tenure security and tenure reform. But what has been an issue has been around the pace in the implementation of our land reform process in the country, which actually at some stage, as you have said, called for a conversation as in, 19, in 2005 among the different players on how do we unblock these challenges. So what has happened in 2018? Parliamentarians actually said, we need to have a, a conversation again as South Africa to say, what are the other bottlenecks that we need to address? And one of the things that people said was, if you look at our constitution section 25 and the provisions of how the state can resolve the blockages and deal with issues of equitable redress, there's some things that are not quite clear. They might be there implicit, but we want to make those explicit. So section 25 really is about clarifying whether the state can expropriate for public interest, as the constitution rightly say so. But in instances where you have taken all other measures that are provided for in that section 25, 2 A and until I think G, those clauses that are there, the state might come to a determination that when you take the value of the land, the current use, the investment that the state had put in terms of subsidy, you reach a point of nil compensation. So the argument was nil compensation or expropriation without compensation is it actually explicit in our constitution? And a majority of citizens, they were saying it's not explicit enough. And that's the process that, that section 25 is dealing with. But it's important for all of us to note that the constitution gives a framework, but whatever we do in our constitutional democracy, you have to have an act of parliament that provides for that constitutional clause. So what public works have been doing is actually to have a bill which is now in parliament dealing with expropriation, you know, mechanism to say under what conditions can you expropriate, under what, you know, what processes can those who are being expropriated have the recourse to make sure that their interests are actually attended to. In my view, that legislation is actually going to create much clarity on how to expropriate as a state for both public interest and for public purpose. And it's important to say that expropriation as a mechanism, other countries call it land adjustment or whatever it is, it runs across a number of governments because you, you are dealing with a machine in your country to say, how do you deal with particular issues that deal with issues of land? Do you want to actually make sure that you deal with equitable redress by making sure that you can expropriate for industries in order to create factories, or you can expropriate for creating human settlement where there is necessity? Because that power is the power that the state has. But how does that exercise of power by government make sure that it does not disadvantage the citizens? And where citizens don't feel comfortable in the way in which they've been treated, they've got your judiciary, which can become an arbiter between the state and an individual. And I think for me, if there might have been concerns, the Expropriation Act further clarifies 
the mechanism that the legislators in section 25 are going to make explicit in terms of the clauses of the constitution as they would want to amend. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, Minister, for uh, providing that clarification. Um, and, you know, as a follow-up to that, I'm just going to um, direct a question to you, Kali. So, you know, what do you, what do you think is the strategic importance of, of land reform um, and agriculture in this country from a social and, and economic growth perspective? And also just, just for you to unpack some of the concerns that, that are there with land reform and the challenges that are in the, in the space. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I think, uh, first of all, uh, we all agree that, that land reform is, is necessary, uh, redressing the injustices of the past, et cetera, et cetera. And that the, the principle is that we must create welfare. We must uh, alleviate poverty. We must create jobs. And, and we realize that land reform can create growth. We realize that we've got um, an agricultural sector where the commercial part of the, com com uh, of the agricultural sector has proven that we can provide food security. So we've got that specific vehicle which makes it possible. And I want to add to that that we also have the, uh, the goodwill of the commercial farmers who really feel that we've got to take hands in order to make land reform possible. We know that what we have achieved in the last 25 years is not much. We know that time is running out and we know the urgency of land reform and that we must definitely start to prove that we are successful in terms of land reform. Now, I think we've learned a lot in the last 25 years, and we realize what are all the reasons for the, the low level of success, in spite of all the uh, opportunities uh, that we have got. We, we have indicated and we know what all the inefficiencies are. We know all the reasons. So my, uh, the point I want to make is that let's take from the past and learn what, what, was, what, was not, what was the reasons for the slow progress that we've made. And then in our discussion, I would like to point out what I would suggest as, as in, in terms of the practical experience that we have with our farmers and with our emerging farmer friends, we normally sit around the bry place and talk about the business of agriculture and, and sharing our common problems, because their problems is the same as our problems, um, and how they feel about it and how they actually feel how we should take hands in order to get, and the minister has, has, has indicated that a government cannot do this alone. And we all realize that, and this is why the, the idea of the public-private uh, growth initiative and the public-private uh, programs uh, should really, we should focus on that to, to take hands and say, listen, where can we learn from each other and how can we strengthen each other in terms of where the one partner needs advice, support or encouragement from the other partner? Okay. So, so, so thanks, thanks for that, Kali. And, um, and and I think what's also coming out is is there's a good understanding that land reform needs to happen, um, and the 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 benefits of land reform are there. Uh, but with all the challenges that are there, as well, it's important going forward to take those lessons and and um, and try and and change the way things are done. And uh, and I think. Uh, a question to you, TP, um, is when you look from an economic development perspective, when you look at uh, land reform and uh, the potential benefits that can come out of it from a uh, job creation perspective, given the, um, the labor intensity of the agriculture space um, and an opportunity for economic growth as well, 
Uh, what are some of the opportunities that you're seeing for participation in agriculture value chains and also uh, exports and new job creation in the country? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Moderator, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, uh, certainly, agriculture uh, extraordinarily important. Uh, all of us agree to both the social and economic progress of this country. So, uh, just to start off by saying that, in terms of the key building blocks uh, around, uh, you know, advancing the uh, agenda on land reform. Uh, both Minister and uh, uh, Kali have already touched on this. Yes, one, there is need for land access. You have to have a piece of land to be able to farm. Uh, but in addition to that, we know that uh, uh, particularly emerging farmers require access to the requisite infrastructure to make the land productive. There have been too many numerous cases of Yes, land is available, but a bit of struggles in terms of access to water, uh, access to infrastructure for storage of, uh, of produce, uh, access to rail systems for transporting uh, produce and so on. So yes, uh, access to infrastructure. In the third instance, a crucial need for uh, technical support, technical expert assistance. Farming is a very scientific uh, uh, profession these days is a very science-based uh, uh, business these days and therefore people require expertise in terms of how best to cultivate land, how best to look after uh, plants, uh, how best to take care of the health of animals and so on and so on. And then of course the fourth point that has been uh, highlighted and this is very much underlined um, in the master plans that have been developed and that is expanding opportunities for market access so that those who farm can um, uh, indeed uh, their product find its way to market and of course from a development finance perspective uh, indeed supporting ministers perspective call it appropriate funding uh, we know on the one hand you don't want to simply base your funding programs on the basis of uh, giving grants. But on the one hand, it is very difficult for agricultural enterprises to carry huge volumes of debt on their balance sheets. It suffocates uh, uh, businesses. So hence uh, this initiative that was referred to by Minister around blending money so that a combination of both debt as well as grant type money from the state provides a viable uh, capital structure uh, for agricultural enterprises. Uh, I can't complete this conversation without touching on the need for uh, sound social and environmental practices. It is very important and this, I know many South African farmers have embraced this, but we still have problems. It is important that from a social perspective, those who live uh, particularly and work at the farms should have decent living conditions, decent housing, their children having decent access to schooling and uh, recreational amenities, um, and so on and so on, so that they are livable spaces, not just places to go and uh, deliver labor and sweat. Uh, and of course, uh, to Kali's point, the point about building partnerships. What I have come to learn uh, in the area of development finance is that it is a, a, a coordinated uh, ecosystem of institutions that make things work. You need the development finance institution to do uh, financing that is appropriate. You need the state to do this. In South Africa, you need the big agricultural co-ops. Uh, you need the major farmers in this country who have very strong established uh, uh, marketing systems and technical capabilities. All those brought under one roof in order to coordinate a system that will also uplift those who are new to the sector. I mean, agriculture, as you know, uh, Mr. Moderator, extraordinarily important in terms of employment creation. As of today, it's close to 900,000 people who are employed in the agricultural sector. And that number can be increased 
uh, yeah. the important uh, linkages that uh, the agricultural sector provides. I mean, on a backward looking basis, uh, uh, suppliers of fertilizers, suppliers of uh, equipment like tractors and other things, suppliers of fuel, uh, the agricultural sector is the demand point for these uh, 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 linkages. And indeed, on the forward looking side, the agricultural sector feeds into agri agro manufacturing or agro processing. It feeds into the retail sector. I mean, if you go into any retail store, I need not say, uh, probably the shelves relating to food are the largest shelves in these spaces. So extraordinarily important to, to, to the sector. I mean, the export opportunities that uh, the IDC has gotten itself involved in recent times has largely been in the areas of fruits. And we know even during this COVID situation, that portfolio has performed very well uh, because agriculture is about human sustenance. So yes, uh, I can come back and uh, uh, talk uh, more about uh, factors that could drive investment and so on. Thanks a lot, uh, Tafi. Okay. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think it's it's uh, you. I think you closed off by just talking about the opportunities that are actually there, even export opportunities, but emphasizing that to tap into those opportunities, it's also important that the emerging farmers and land reform beneficiaries uh, uh, have, uh, get the proper development support that they need from okay. a technical perspective, uh, a finance perspective, and long-term partnerships and emphasizing the, the, the importance of the appropriate funding, because it has to be supportive of the business models that they're running as well. Um, and, and going back to you, Minister, what, are you, what do you see as uh, the major investment opportunities in, in land reform um, and agriculture value chain? Well, thank you very much, uh, Tafi and the panelists. Thanks, Kali and uh, TP. I must say that, um, as we all agree, land is just but one element. But infrastructure investment in agriculture, particularly on irrigation, will actually give us more opportunities at the moment. If you look at the Limpompo Valley, that's one area where we can actually expand on citrus as well as uh, you know, other crops. If you look at Tawu, the Valhats, you also still have the opportunity for expansion. You have got land, but you need irrigation. So infrastructure development, particularly directed to agriculture, is important. Agrologistic is another. Because in order to connect farmers to the market, you need not only good roads, but you also need um, rain to be able to take those goods into the market, some of them into the export market. So I would say for me, infrastructure, and particularly South Africa's rural areas, if we had to just open that space in terms of rail and roads, a lot can happen. And if you look at the other areas of the marketing infrastructure, again, it's another element. I was sharing uh, with you, Tafi, in the morning, one of my experiences that I had in Limpompo just last month when I was doing my oversight. There was this small farmer who had been given by the traditional chief 125 hectares to plant, you know, potatoes. In the Capricorn district, which is around your Pulukwane area. And yeah. he was saying to me, he's already exporting to Mozambique. I was like, wow, really? He said, yeah, and actually, I decided on Mozambique because Mozambique uh, buyers are actually buying potatoes that are not washed as opposed to your South African consumers who would like washed potatoes in their bags. And he said, so I asked, what is the challenge that you are facing that you are actually producing the commercial in a communal area, for instance, what is the dynamic? with the other uh, community members. He actually said, we've well, worked out a good uh, arrangement. I employ for the picking season, but when I finish, the community plant their staple food, maize and others, and when my season comes, there is no tension. 
and it helps me on crop rotation, but it also manages the issues of security because I know that these community members see this as part of their asset. What that means is that we need to create an enabling environment that would enable our farmers small and big to thrive. The issue that Carl mentioned, expertise and know-how. Technological as well as other technical expertise is important. You know, sometimes we think training in a school, in a class is important, but with farmers, Kali can tell you, it's on the ground to know how many centimeters between a cob and another, and how deep you go. And those things need mentorship and practical training. And this is where we can leverage the experience that is there among our farming community. I think uh, when we got cut off, uh, Minister, you were, you were uh, the one who was speaking. And I see on the questions on the, from the panel uh, panelists as well, one of the questions that uh, came from Ed was um, saying that when it comes to attracting investment in this space, uh, what are the key things that should be done, that you think should be done, uh, considering that it's a space that hasn't been able to attract investments in the past? Well, thank you very much. Um, obviously, one of the areas would be you either an investor may want to invest in an existing enterprise already, where there could be a conversation between the people who are already there as well as the investor. The other may be an investor wanting to access land in order to actually invest in production capacity. Another yeah. element could be an investor who would like to bring in a processing plant of what is being produced and what may be required from government might be the location where the areas for growth. If you were to ask agriculture, for instance, in terms of productivity, I would say your growing areas would be your Eastern Cape, your KwaZulu-Natal um, area, your Limpopo. They are still many possibilities for investment. But if you talk for agro-processing, areas such as Gauteng, also because of its proximity, areas such as the Western Coast because of the proximity to the ports, as well as land and you know, air, those are better positioned in terms of your agro-processing. But it doesn't mean you can't uh, locate in South Africa's untapped areas such as the Eastern Cape. We're seeing in Glentane what we hold have done there. They've started with the production and they've now moved to the agribusiness uh, side, particularly on the storage capacity. So there are possibilities, but the issue may be, where do I get this information? From the yeah. Department of Agriculture, in the provinces, as well as the National Department of Agriculture nationally, where such information may be available. The Department of Trade and Industry and Competition is another uh, space around which, you know, information on the possible investment areas could be there. IDC, the okay. agribusiness space, is another element. So that's what I can say. Um, in this conversation from the question that comes from our chat group. Okay, th thank you so much. Um, and, I, and I think when you look at some of the opportunities in the agriculture space, uh, there are areas where those partnerships are required, especially public and private sector partnerships. Um, for instance, like in the aquaculture space, where location is, is, is important. Um, and there are some, there's land that might be owned by um, the government or municipalities where there can be those partnerships for, for mutual benefit. Um, and uh, while we're waiting for Kali to come in, uh, TP, I just wanted to just, what's your assessment of the current risks from a financing perspective that are there in the land reform space? And, you know, how can those, uh, be reduced through development finance mm -hmm. and who needs to play that that de-risking role yeah uh, thank you thank you Tafi. Uh, uh, again just to reiterate that you know uh, the opportunities are, are, are massive in this sector uh, 
But uh, South Africa, I believe, has to play to its own strengths. You know, we uh, we we are a country. I think, Minister, which has somewhere in the part of uh, 100 million hectares or something like that of uh, um, farmland, uh, but only approximately 15, 16 percent, which is considered quite arable. Uh, a lot of it is uh, uh, dry land suitable for grazing and so on and so on. So if you come to think about it, that's why South Africa is a very strong producer of uh, of uh, livestock. Uh, and I think uh, I want to take that, uh, Taffy, and, and push it forward and say, uh, I hope Minister will agree with me that the full potential of what can be done with uh, land in traditional areas has not yet been fully realized uh, to the minister's point about uh, tenure reforms where indeed if people have uh, security of tenure and so on in traditional land, particularly the provinces of KZN, uh, the Eastern Cape and Limpopo, there could be massive investment that could be uh, uh, attracted in those areas in partnership with uh, major in, uh, investors working with the uh, communities and entrepreneurs in those areas. So some of the risks that are there, uh, we already touched on. Uh, technology risks uh, these days, uh, uh, you know, environmental impact risks. Uh, unfortunately, farming uh, uses a lot of water. Uh, sometimes uh, the use of uh, chemicals and so on, not so very friendly to uh, soil, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, unpredictable weather conditions. That is why environmental management systems, and we know that our research organizations such as the CSIR and universities are bringing in a lot of innovations to manage these natural risks. The other risks of a market and a technical nature we've already touched on, Tafi, in terms of uh, bringing to bear institutional expertise working with the yeah. major buyers to create a demand pool. Uh, you know, if you don't have a market, you don't have a business in any yeah, right. uh, environment, whether it's agriculture or manufacturing of steel or mining. So it's very important. And under the master plans uh, of under the umbrella of uh, agriculture, be it poultry and uh, sugar one and the one that minister referred to, which is coming. I know that Minister Titiza working with Minister Patel driving that process uh, to create a demand pool so that we can then back solve for expanding of, uh, of, of capacity on the one side. But also uh, 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 certain uh, sectors of uh, agriculture could potentially, and we've seen in the past, suffer from uh, trade vulnerabilities where there becomes maybe problems of dumping product and things like that. And we know our government has worked very closely on the trade side and the minister as the head of the sector to, to, to mitigate against uh, uh, poor international trade practices uh, uh, around agriculture. We cannot conclude this conversation without pointing to the upside potential minister of uh, trading into Africa under the uh, Common Free Trade Agreement. I mean, we, are the, we have the advantage of land availability. We have the advantage of technological capabilities, the financial and banking system that is able to fund projects. Uh, and indeed, I believe a very conducive policy environment, which is being uh, improved on a constant basis. And if we play our cards well, uh, uh, as a nation and those who are investors and operators in the agricultural sector. We can position ourselves very well. Many of the countries in, in the rest of the continent, in as much as they have uh, large tracts of land as well, are still net importers of food. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, uh, I was looking at statistics the other day. You know, Nigeria, a big net importer of certain very basic uh, food. Yes, they will have to go through their own development cycle. But in the meantime, we are brothers and sisters on the continent. We should be able to produce and supply under the free trade agreement. So, so thank you. Um, and, I, and I guess, Minister, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity to yes. close. Uh, but yes. also, going forward, what would be uh, an appropriate way or what are the appropriate vehicles of getting 
everyone in the ecosystem together. I can just say briefly that, yes, indeed, we have. For instance, if you look at some of the projects that have been announced in the infrastructure uh, seminar symposium that have been held that deals with the issues of macadamia investment, particularly in uh, areas of Pumalanga and Telapia in the Eastern Cape, those are some of the areas that are already ready. But at the same time, I think the conversation working with government will be able to strengthen you know, as we are working with partners, we've got a CEO forum where we work with the various uh, CEOs of agribusiness uh, enterprises as well as uh, farmers uh, organization to really try and coordinate our efforts. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. And so last words from you, TV. No, no, no. Uh, I think as a country, we have uh, many things going for us land availability, infrastructure, which uh, the president is driving to improve financial systems, the policy environment that is being improved on a constant basis. Under the leadership, let's orchestrate these institutions for greater synergies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and thank, thank you. you all for, for, for yeah. tuning into this session and thank, thank, a big thank you to the participants. Um, for the contribution. Unfortunately, we have run out of time um, and apologies for the technical issues that we've experienced in this session. Um, and this is an important session. We should, should not stop um, in this session only. I think those discussions need to keep going. Thank you very much.